So we get into structural soil. Um, and I don't know, it wasn't about structural soil, but I had a conversation earlier with somebody. But structural soil is one of those things, like a whole long list of things that have come through the green industry, that it comes out and everybody think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's going to solve everybody's problems. I'm going to use it everywhere. And to be progressive, I have to use it. Everybody else thinks that I'm behind the times. OK? Um, I understand that. But also, with all these things that come along, including structural soil, we really need to understand what it is, how it functions, where it's useful, where it's not useful, um, and where there's better alternatives. So the structural soil concept is fairly simple. Most of them are made of some kind of rock. Um, you know, if you go walk out on a rock path or a pile of gravel, you don't sink in because the rocks are, are touching each other and, and they, they keep your weight up. Um, in gravel, it's just air in between, and it's not particularly good for roots to grow on. So um, what they do with the structural soils is they put soil in between the rocks so that the roots can grow in the sort of the uh, network of soil filled spaces in between the rock, and, and then the rock can still hold up the pavement above it. Uh, keep in mind that the mix is mostly rock. Okay, it may look like a lot of soil there. That's actually the uh, Cornell mix. Okay, uh, but it's defined, I believe, right around 20% soil and 80% stone. And the reason, you, if you put more than 20%, it's a very precise formula. If you put more than 20% uh, soil in it, when you compact it, the soil is going to be compacted between the stones. So you have to have little enough soil that it fills up those spaces loosely, but doesn't get compacted when you're compacting the mix in the ground. So that's why they use, the Cornell mix uses such a precise uh, uh, formula. Okay, And this is some of that being installed downtown. Is that the Social Security building with the big baseball bat outside of it, on, uh, just west of the river? Um, I think what they were doing is, is here was really installing sort of anti-terrorism landscape around the building a decade or two ago, probably two decades ago. Uh, but they were, they're going to have big pavement there, and they're using structural soils, and you can see the tree pits and, and, and such. Uh, and I guess it has to be put in in six-inch lifts and compacted and, and all that to, to meet specs. Um, a lot of times I see the Europeans being a little less precise about the installation. I don't know if they have different engineering standards, different horticultural standards. But they often bring in a bunch of big rocks, and then they bring in a bunch of soil, the drier the better, and then vibrate the soil into the rocks. Okay, <laughs> But it's the same concept. The rock's holding up the pavement above it, and the soil's in between there for the, for the roots to grow. So there's different versions. The original structural soil, didn't go by that name, was Amsterdam tree soil, which was really uh, angled sand of very precise and evenly graded dimensions that, again, the sand itself held, held things up. But in that case, the roots kind of pushed the sand away, I think, rather than growing in between the particles. Um, so diff different formulations, but they all have the same goal in mind. Oh, this is interesting one. I had a hap happened to have the good fortune to be at the same place like 12 years apart. Um, and from the eucalyptus trees, you can see it's not close. <laughs> it's actually the Olympic grounds in Sydney. Okay, and I was there when they were constructing the, the, the grounds about a year or two before they had the Olympics. And you see what they did here is um, all this is the structural soil. So this is a, uh, the, and, and in fact, you can see it later here. There's just, uh, this is not the exact same spot, but they have big expanses where the, they're expecting traffic and, and, and people and maybe more than people. And, and that's the structural soil bed. But then they did what is ideal. They have these large planting beds where they did not use structural soil. Because remember, structural soil is 80% rock. Okay, So they were providing for the trees to do well for a reasonable period of time in the planting soil. You can see ultimately they mulched around you know, over that soil. 
and then in between it, use the structural soil so the roots could get out of those generous, uh, you know, planting beds in, in, in between. And I mean, these trees were, what year? No, it was probably more than 15 years. But I mean, that was just like three, three years ago, something like that. And I mean, they're all doing just fine. They are eucalyptus trees are kind of tough, I realize. But um, you know, that's kind of ideally, I've seen a few people wanting to actually put you as backfill in the planting hole, fill it with structural soil. You know, which I guess if you're gonna put pavement all the way up to the trunk, you might have reason to wanna do that, but that's not, you know, the, the ideal situation by any means. Um, okay, now the time to start talking about whether you can really believe what you're seeing. So have you picked out yet that that's just a brick wall on that building and it's just a painting? <laughs> So sometimes what you see is not necessarily what you get. And so this is my little lesson on really being critical about what you're seeing in a couple of different ways. <clears throat> um, okay, back to the, the Bartlett Tree Research Lab. And this is not to knock them. The one thing about research, when you publish research papers, you have to be very precise, okay? You have to say what the results were under what conditions, what it applies to, what it doesn't apply to, et cetera, okay? Um, so when you read something that's based on research, don't extrapolate in your mind beyond the conditions that are set out in that report. And the report on this paper would, and it has been published, but I didn't go back and read it, but it's probably something to the effect of structural soil, uh, trees perform, equally as well in structural soil as in this good soil, 100% soil with suspended, you know, under, over, under suspended pavement uh, for the first three years, because that's when the study ended. And maybe it was four, maybe, it, I mean, but it was a few years, okay? Question is, what happens 10 or 15 years down the road? They're all in fairly limited spaces. Um, they have whatever they have to, to draw upon below ground. Um, and you gotta be thinking about that because you're probably, you shouldn't be just interested in what happens for the first five years. So think of it this way, you know, back to this suspended pavement structural soil. Um, this is a good representation of structural soil. You saw some in another picture. Um, if you planted a tree in this container in, or in that container, which one would you think would be bigger? Or would you plant a tree in both containers? Well, actually, this container is four time, five times as big in volume, but it has the same amount of soil, okay? And so the way I stole another picture from Jim Irvin, the way he expressed it, and this actually, there is a publication on this. Um, if you have a large planter with the 80% rock, a small planter, maybe one-fifth the size and, and completely filled with soil, and then another large planter filled with 100% soil. The large planter filled with partial rock is gonna be, the tree's gonna be about the same size as the small planter filled with 100% soil, but this one, it's got more space, it's gonna get bigger. Does that make sense? It's really the growth of the tree is gonna be more dependent on the amount of soil that it has that can hold water, that can hold nutrients, et cetera, than anything else. There's all kinds of fudge factors involved that we won't go into the details, but the, the basic you know, principle is that if you're in a position where you gotta support pavement with the soil and you have four times as much soil, you might have just about the same amount of growth as if you had just had an open planter that's smaller somehow. So you gotta calculate those kind of things into uh, you know, what you wanna see down the road somewhere. Uh, and actually this is, I read a paper one time and they were talking about uh, trees on one side of the street that were planted in structural soil and trees on another side, the other side of the street were more in an open lawn area. And they tracked the growth of these trees for, <clears throat> I'm thinking it was 10 years if I remember right something in that range, maybe eight years, 10 years. And they said that um, 
you know, that the tree, I believe, without having gone back to read the details of the paper, uh, I believe they said that the trees in the structural soil were doing just about as well as the trees in the lawn across the way. And so I mentioned that to someone who knew the site, and they said, you got to be kidding me. I said, why? Well, because I'll explain. So I ended up actually going to like uh, Google Maps and going down that street. <laughs> And what I found is on this side of the street is where the structural soil is, okay? Um, and the structural soil was described as being applied in a two, a two meter long trench between successive trees up and down the street. I'm only showing you one, okay? Which is okay, that happens, that you get a bit of that shared planting, you know, shared planting pit kind of thing. Um, but what they don't address is all of this open space behind the sidewalk. Okay. They don't say that there was a barrier in between that prevented the roots getting out there. They don't say that the roots could have gotten out there. I can only, since I didn't say it was, the structural soil was isolated from that soil, I can only surmise that the roots had a good opportunity, and some of the spaces behind there were bigger. You know, this is the one where I could get a picture where a car wasn't parked in a parking space. So, yeah, and then the, the, the trees on the other side of the street, I mean, you know, and you put those together, whoop. and you know, by some measurement, I don't doubt that the trees were doing relatively equally, but at least those two trees I could get a clear shot of don't exactly look the same either. Um, so, and that's not, I'm not trying to be negative on structural soil, I'm just trying to say it has limitations and that you have to be very careful at what you read and, and people tell you, so don't believe what I, I say either. Um, so, you know, and structural soils are best, they say, if you have a porous pavement over them, because if you have all that, that soil in between the stones for some grand distance, um, if you don't have water and air getting to it, you're, you're kind of losing part of the benefit of it. So it's typically promoted to have some kind, even, you know, this is very typical, actually it's out of Sydney, but this is where they didn't have structural soil. Um, but you also see a lot of concrete being poured over structural soil, and, and then you have to question as to what resources are getting to that soil uh, to end the roots in that soil if they get there. Um, Susan will recognize this one, but it doesn't exist anymore. Is it gone yet? Replaced this week. <laughs> There's a new porous paper. Yeah. Apparently the the, the ground beer bottles were not, not a, not. Oh, is that what it was? I thought, I thought maybe it was a politically incorrect thing to have ground beer bottles on. <laughs> or that people thought they were going to cut themselves if they fell. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyway, um, but, and, and that is exactly probably one of the big problems we have in this area with porous pavements, with freeze thaw and everything else, not being an engineer or an architect or anything, but it seems logical to me that that's a problem. Um, and you know, that's just a close up of that one, but there has been some work done on porous pavements um, and the benefits to trees, uh, but not a lot. Um, and this was a study that was done in uh, New Zealand by Justin Morganroth, I think for his PhD work. And so they've got, uh, I don't know, porous ones, probably the wet one, holds more water maybe. Um, Non-porous pavements are probably the, the dry one and then the, the non-paved areas in between. And so they spent a lot of work on that and they actually did get more growth out of the porous pavement, which I don't really understand why, and I'm not sure if he had an explanation as why you get more growth than the unpaved area. Unless, uh, well, we can look at the, the conditions a little bit. I don't want to spend too much time on his data, but <clears throat> the, uh, what you see is that in the, the unpaved area, it's kind of hard to read all that stuff, but the surface soil was drier, as you would expect, in the summer, you know, the surface soil dries out, the subsoil stays a little more moist. In the, uh, the porous pavement, especially, the, the deeper soil, it's only 20 centimeters down, but the deeper soil stayed 
more moist, and then this one was kind of in between. Um, so that's a little confusing to me is what that data means. Um, and then he looked at aeration through actually rusting of steel rods, which we've done some of. And, and it, even the porous pavement was much less aerated underneath than the open ground. Uh, the impervious pavement, when you got down to 36 centimeters, had a lot less um, air in the soil. But why was the impervious and the pervious pavements kind of the same? Um, you would it's, supposedly it's in, you know was it getting clogged? Probably not. I think the uh, explanation is in the way the test was set up, and that's not to say that it was a bad test, but it's just how you interpret the data. Each of these plots, and I think they said they were square, but they don't look like it in the picture. Um, I think, but it was 7.5 feet, 2.3 meters across. Okay, how wide's the sidewalk here? Five feet. Five. Okay, roots grow under sidewalks, right? <laughs> we know that. <laughs> um, that means there's, in fact, there's a lot of problem not getting roots to grow under sidewalks and get them up. That tells me that aeration is pretty easy to get, and, and water for that matter, easy to get around the edges to the middle of a five foot diameter sidewalk, okay? First of all, this is only 7.5 feet, and there's a hole in the middle, which also allows for aeration. So. I got a feeling that the, it wasn't a big enough space to re, for the impervious pavement to really limit the, the aeration especially. Um, so you gotta watch that kind of thing. Um, it doesn't, so I'm not, I'm not, I don't really know whether the pervious pavements really do well for trees or not because the, the information's not really conclusive that's out there. I mean, whoop, sorry, I hit that twice. We actually did something that was kind of similar uh, working with the city of Chicago, uh, looking at alternatives, uh, these rubber material alter alternatives to um, the infamous tree grates that all municipal people at least hate. I don't know about landscape architects in general. But um, what we found, this is actually a precast. It's, it's the same rubber material as they put in playgrounds and things like that. Some of it they poured in place, and this one was actually precast. And the only aeration it had, because we had plastic under all this, this is our simulated pavement. I mean, there was like a half a dozen quarter inch holes drilled in the cracks. And these were overlapping, so they didn't get a whole lot of air in that crack, but there was, it wasn't sealed. Um, we even tried to seal up around the base with some of the other material. And I'll be darned, aeration was just wonderful under those things all summer. We eventually went out and put big sheets of plastic trying to cut air out, trying to just, Get, our, get the air that we sucked out of these things to, to actually be low in oxygen. And it really made me wonder just how much oxygen gets into the soil through every little crack that's out there. You know, and we've never followed up on that yet, but maybe someday I'll get around to being able to do that.